if you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This is another of our popular Listener's Choice interviews, which we're playing over the weekend. We've chosen the most popular interviews for you to select the Listener's Choice winner. If you're not sure how the Listener's Choice competition works, have a look at horsechats.com slash choice for the rules and the leaderboard. Horse welfare and safety are of utmost importance where humans have any interaction with horses. Within the courses at International Horse College, we only utilise methods that promote safe and humane ways of interaction between horses and humans. We only support safe methods of educating riders, handlers and trainers about horse welfare. Internationalhorsecollege.com, registered training organisation 31352. Our guest today is Andrea Riddell Carrison or Andrea Riedel Carrison. She's an internationally qualified coach and a show horse drudge who's also got a background in dressage, show jumping and eventing, but we're going to talk to her today about her other specialty area, which is an equine specialist veterinary nurse. How are you today, Andrea? I'm good, thank you, Glennis. How good, are you? Good. Now, Andrea, your favourite quote. What's your favourite quote that you'd like to share with us? Well, I guess I should mention the person that I learnt the quote from, and that was one of my very early instructors, and that was Graham Parham. He was known as Kanga around most of the South Australian equestrian world. And that quote is, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change Courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Yeah. So so I think that's really relevant with horses. And uh, interestingly enough, I actually, when I was reading Franz Moringa's book, it's on the inside of his book. So I'm yes. not quite sure where... I think Graham knew Franz, so I think it was quite um, a friendship that developed and he took that quote on and I've taken it on again. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, you know, I've heard the quote before and I think it's certainly something you can reflect on, isn't it? You know, you're talking about, you know, with horses, particularly oh, with exactly. horses. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. You can tick all the boxes, but sometimes you just, you know, might not be on in reality what it was meant to be on paper. And, and um, you know, that's the wisdom, isn't it? To, yes, yes. To make that decision and either go forward with something that you don't think is working for you or change and get something else. Yep, yep. Andrea, tell me about an early memory with horses. When did you first start? What was the background? But but the actual memory, the day that you remembered this. Oh, look, the day would, would have to be... Um, my father was a mounted policeman and we lived in Adelaide in Morfittville and uh, they'd bought me a pony, I was five, and it was the memory of my father, and I can't exactly give you the day, but it was a regular occurrence that my dad would pedal his push bike around Glenelg, which is quite close to Morfittville, and as a five-year-old, I would be trotting along next to him, and he would lead me on my pony, and we would trot around all the streets of Glenelg, and quite regularly, my pony would cow kick and stick his hoof through the spokes of my dad's back wheel, and my dad would be splattering (laughs) 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 up. You know, and those are the days there was no helmets or anything like that so that's a really early memory me gripping onto my little monkey strap on my pony pad and and trotting around you know Glenelg it would have been the early hours when the streets were quite quiet but yeah that that is definitely a a very fond memory of my dad and me and what we used to do on the weekends (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Did you ever get any photos of that? That would certainly be, you know. I'm not photo. sure that we've got a photo of Dad pedalling and me trotting along next to him, but yeah. um, I, there is some very fond memories of that pony. He was very dear to me and lived to quite an old age. And, you know, the, the Glenelg pageant where I went as a fairy because my father had 
diligently broke and had him broken into harness and that all sort of fell through when Dad did a practice run and the pony demolished someone's front wall and <laughs> <laughs> down the streets of Glenelg. And it was a quick costume change and I went as a fairy um, holding my wand and the pony never got to go in the Glenelg pageant oh, yeah. in, in the car. But, you know, that was my dad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was oh, like, yeah, good. hang on for the ride. It was yeah. always a little bit of excitement in our house. <laughs> Now, from there, because your father had a, you know, even though he was in the police force, he was in the mounted police force. So his career yes. crossed over yes. into the horse industry too. Yeah. Were you always going to work in the horse industry or because you've also been a veterinary nurse and you're equine specialist? Was that because you're a vet nurse first and then went equine or how did I it work I was always out? interested in horses from a very early age. My closest brother, who's nine years older than me, he was a little interested Um, in the horses, uh, but my parents both rode, but um, Dad especially was in the Mounted Police and he had a great affinity with horses and I actually still have his stock saddle that he rode in the force in. But it was from that interest when I took up veterinary nursing and the opportunity to specialise in the equine study side of it that I sort of channeled my energies into that from yep. my equestrian background. Yep, yep, yep. So if someone's going to work with horses and have a career with horses, because as an equine specialist nurse, you would see other people in different areas of the horse industry, and also to knowing your father in the mounted police force, what sort of core skills or character traits does someone need to work in the horse industry? Look, it, I think as a vet It's very difficult if you've never really been exposed to horses Mm -hmm. or larger animals and you've only done domestic animals to to then go into a mixed practice. I think there's quite a bit of confidence in your whole body language, really, more so than a strength issue with horses. I think... um, how you conduct yourself in a very strong, quiet manner without a lot of quick movements and high voice pitch. I think that is the most important thing, especially when, obviously, when you're seeing horses in a stressful environment at the veterinary clinic, they're often having something done that they don't enjoy, needles and x-rays, and they're in a, an, uh, you know, they're out of their comfort zone. So to be very strong and quiet and manage those horses in stressful environments is certainly something that would be very highly sought um, as far as an equine nurse or an equestrian vet for sure. Yep. Yep. Yes, because some vets are vets because of their background and their affinity with dogs and cats and smaller animals, you know, to go on into, as you say, a mixed practice. You know, they might be thinking, well, I'm just going to just do the animals and just work in the surgery and there's other vets that are going out on call to do the horses and the cattle and everything. Absolutely. But but sometimes, yeah, they might be on emergency that weekend or something and they may have to come out and and manage a horse. Exactly. Mm. And inevitably there's going to be that cut leg or that colic case or foreign body in, in an eye or something where that vet who's a perfectly capably qualified vet but is not terribly comfortable dealing with horses who, you know, they're big and they can be difficult to handle. And the and many owners, you know, I see it on both sides of the spectrum, you know, terribly disdainful about this poor vet that's trying to deal with this horse that was difficult to handle and the owners are saying, well, I said to do this and they wanted to do that. And, you know, it is terribly tricky. And I think sometimes having an equine nurse who is involved in the equestrian Uh, world just to be a mediator is extremely important, especially in those times of stress. You've got a stressful owner, you've got a nervous vet who's very capable, Mm. but doesn't know how to handle this horse. And they often want to give them a lot of um, sedation and, you know, the owners don't have a, an appropriate area to have that horse sedated. So to have an equestrian nurse or an equine nurse with them who they trust to, you know, contain that animal and control it so that they can go ahead and do their job is extremely important for vets. 
you know, I was thinking of a vet nurse, you know, but because I'd been a vet nurse and thinking of yes. the skills that I needed and I used. But you're right, you know, working with vets without the experience, you would be a mediator. You would sort of be trying to keep the communication open between the two and, and get both points of view because you've got the experience with both points and, yeah, uh, exactly. offer assistance. Yep. Exactly. And often you're known in the equestrian world. So mm. you're often dealing with friends or, or people that you know, yes. um, acquaintances. And I think they were more comfortable knowing that you were there as the person that they could, you know, say, I know the vet wants to do this, but I really think this horse is going to be tricky. And, and, you know, you have to read the situation a little mm. bit and, um, and, you know, tactfully suggest to the vet, yes, I understand that this is what you want to do, but we don't think this horse is going to react in a positive manner if that's what you decide to do. You know, we've, we've had vets try to hobble horses to, mm -hmm. to stitch them up. Well, yep. in, in reality, if a horse has never had hobbles on, it becomes a terribly dangerous situation. Yeah, so sure. it's a really tricky call, and and sometimes you you never overrule anybody, but you try and you know get that situation under control, uh, remembering that the the animal is your priority, yes. but the safety of your clients and your co-workers are also equally as important to get this job done as well as possible. Yeah, yeah. What do you think is the best thing about being a veterinary nurse? An oh, equine special. I shouldn't just say veterinary nurse. An equine specialist yeah. veterinary nurse. Yeah. Well, you know, the the equine specialist is wonderful because I get to deal with horses that I absolutely adore. But general vet nursing, I'd have to say, it's the animals and the clients of some of those dear older animals that you see for many years and it's a bit like you know those older ponies that you know you see regularly because they have a foot issue and we it's an ongoing service to them to, to keep those ponies comfortable in their older age because often ponies you know they get laminitic um, EMS and founder and Cushing's and then their dental work so you know, those ponies that are well-loved and have often gone through the family of three and four children and probably carried them around all at one time or another, yes. um, double dinking or triple yep. dinking like yep. we all used to do in halters and get dragged off under trees and all those sort of dreadful yes. things yes. that nobody's children would be allowed to do these days. But, um, you know, tying the pony outside the bakery and pulling the brand a post down and you know all those terrible <laughs> things and those dear ponies that hold memories for all that family you know the care of them is definitely and to make them most comfortable in their you know in their final final days or yes. weeks and I guess to help people make an educated decision on now it's time yes. you know that's always a really tough call and awfully heartbreaking for everybody including the poor vet nurse who's often there to be you know holding the box of tissues and the pony and and um you know it's it's a always a really tough decision to know when and I think if they're comfortable and they're happy and they're not suffering I think sometimes that early call is a better call than the one where they've just got to the point that you're making the call you have to make. Mm. It's always going to be traumatic, though, either way. Yeah. Of yep. course, in life and death, you know, you have horses, you have, you know, you have live ones, you have dead ones. They they seem to manage to put themselves in some extraordinary situations, <laughs> you know, yes. in fences and trees and, you know, they're very intelligent animals, but sometimes I think, really? <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. oh. Now you talked about your father and um yeah. you know him being instrumental in you starting with horses but what about people who've influenced you in your career? Is this anyone that you'd like to mention there? Yes, definitely Graham Parham would have to be a, a huge influence in my teenage years. I know we used to when we moved from Adelaide to Mount Gambier and Narracourt, which is only an hour away, we used to do a fortnightly clinic with Graham. And it's, it felt like two years, not two weeks or two. And, you know, yeah. people like Scott Teach and 
um, Louise Coulter, who was Louise Wibley, um, famous South Australians, all did, you know, those two weeks. He was a huge, huge influence, and I still can quote him to this day. <laughs> but I think the other person that really influenced me in my chosen sport of the time would have had to have been Lucinda Pryor Palmer. Okay. Reading her books would ha- would have to be the most inspiring stories. The struggle that she went to and then got to the Olympics, it made it, you know, we all have struggles with horses and, and to know that someone so famous had, has had the same struggles or is having this, the same struggles at, at the time was really influential for me. Yeah. You know, that you never give up and you just maybe take the scenic route instead of the direct route with your training, but you still eventually get to the destination. Yes. You know? What about horses? Have you had a horse? You know, you talked about your pony who used to kick out at the bike. (laughs) Oh, yes. (laughs) Who do you think has been instrumental in influence you, helping with your career? Oh, look, I've had some really, really brilliant horses over the years for Lots of different reasons, not always because they were the most successful, Um, sometimes just for their quirky nature and the fact that if you weren't on the ball, they would, you know, (laughs) let you know that you should have been concentrating a bit harder. They've all been fabulous. They've all been different. I must admit I lost a mare about 15 years ago that I thought was going to, you know, she was just beautiful. She was really quirky, really quirky on the ground. But once you were on her back, she would just go wherever you pointed her. She was just, wouldn't question you. But she was really tricky on the ground. And I've had another one that was really perfect on the ground and really tricky to ride. It just sometimes is weird like that, that that some will have these weird traits that don't transfer into when you're on them and and the other times they do. I find genetics in horses is quite interesting that I bred three foals out of the same mare and she was always a mare that scrambled in the float. And these three foals never, ever travelled with her. None of them ever travelled with her as a mare. And they all scrambled in the float. And I find that really interesting that some traits can genetically be passed on, you know, to their offspring, which is quite an interesting thing for me. I find that yeah, really that's, that's quite certainly quirky. certainly interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What yeah. was her name, the, the one that you said was quirky on the ground? Her, her show name was High Pine Prophecy. Because yep. she was by a thor- she was a thoroughbred man. She was by a selling called Canonize. So that's how she ended up with Prophecy. I try and get quirky names, and there's always a reason for my horses. And <laughs> <laughs> um, there's always a bit of a story as to why I called them what I did. But she was she was just beautiful, and she um, I'd showed her for a couple of years, and one morning I got up, and she um, was displaying all the symptoms of colic um, and the vet that I eventually ended up working I called him straight away and he came out and he did a rectal examination on her and he looked at me and he said Andrea she's got a twist her spleen is on the wrong side oh no but he had given her pain relief and she'd started to graze and he said look this is not normal she shouldn't really be you know, this pain relief shouldn't really make this better this quickly. Um, he said, what do you want to do? I said, can you do anything? And he said, all I can do is give you pain relief and hope it goes back. But he said, I'm really, you know, doubtful. Um, so I put her in the float and I drove the five hours to Werribee and they did surgery and the vet said to me before he went to surgery, he said, I'm telling you that the signs are not good. And he said, I'm telling you if I get in there and any of this bowel is compromised, I will not continue. He said, I have seen when I've, con- you know, the owners have forced yes. me to continue and it has ended up that the- I've had to put the horse down in 10 days. He said, if you are prepared that if I go in there and I make the call that we are not going ahead, you have to deal with that. Mm. 
And I said, yep, that's fine, go ahead. Anyway, we put it down on the table and it broke my heart because I came home with an empty float. But, you know, that's, you know, that's horses. They Mm -hmm. just were God badly designed their gut, yes. <laughs> unfortunately. Yes. And and she had enveloped her cecum, which is nearly unheard of. Um, how she did it, they don't know why she did it. They couldn't give me any answers. They just said it's something that happens. They'd seen only ever three or two prior to her. One had been a foal, and one had been an uh, one had been a I think a pony foal, and one had been a um, a Clyde. Uh, you know, an older gelding that yep. had done it. They yep. totally unrelated, had no idea why, and virtually they said you couldn't do it if you tried to do it. Mm. So just one of those freaky things. What about thinking of your proudest moments, Andrea? What's been your proudest moment with horses? Oh, look, sometimes my proudest moments are not when I've been riding, but seeing my students do well, that's wonderful. Um, I think probably for a riding point of view, um, the Memorial Eunice Cutting Thoroughbred Trophy at Adelaide Royal was, you know, very much up there. Um, Going Supreme Show Hunter at Panola Show last year was a huge high. I absolutely love it. There's there's many highs. You know, I couldn't really pinpoint one. Each horse has given me such a wonderful memory of some, you know, something, whether it was winning something or doing something that they made me laugh or, you know, but watching my students go out there and, and do really well, that's that's a buzz nearly on a weekly basis. So yeah. that's fantastic and keeps me interested. Yeah, yeah. Thinking about, you know, for people who'd like to get into the industry to become an equine specialist vet, what do you think the biggest challenges are for them? Oh, look, horses are quirky, they're tricky. The challenges would be probably the owners want you to know exactly what's wrong and to treat it in the cheapest possible way (laughs) because horse people are always a bit, (laughs) you know, don't want to spend that much on it. And I think nearly for a, a vet nurse and a vet, to build a relationship with your clients where they trust you and they know that their interests are at the top of your list sometimes can be the hardest thing to do um, and that you're going to do the very best for them. You will go beyond to do the best for them. I think that is the most important you know, quality, that those yep. people know that you, you go into bat for them no matter what the hardship. And I think that's you know, building that relationship with with the clientele and and being interested in what they do, asking them what they do, you know. Um, even if you're not interested in novelties or harness racing or barrel racing, um, if that's that person's passion, then make it, you know, make it important for you to find out what they, what they do because you'll often get a lot more information from people if they feel that, you are interested in them and the information from your owners is going to be, you know, nearly sometimes 50% of treating the animal that's in front of you. Yep, yep. Okay. Now, thinking about people that will bring the horse to the vet, you know, we can talk about common problems, but common problems of the horse, but common problems of the people that are bringing, you know, I don't know if it's lack of knowledge or not able to handle the horse or maybe it's that you touched on it early that they, you know, want to tell the vet, I suppose that's the more experienced ones would say to the vet, I don't think my horse will cope well with that. But thinking about the more novice people with horses, what's something that they could learn if they were listening to the interview and they can take with them? Yeah. Definitely the novice people are often the parents who have purchased a pony for the child who's interested in riding and have really had no prior horse knowledge or had anything to do with them, it's a huge challenge for non-horsey parents to suddenly become parents that now are horsey parents and have to deal with a pony that, you know, they don't 
I've never had anything to do with. A lot of the common things, especially with us, um, you know, ponies, um, spring and, and the fact that people will think it's, you know, geez, this is great, it's cheap to feed him, I don't have to feed him anything, he can just go out there on the grass all day. Of course, ponies founder, then sugar content in the grass and they need to be locked up. Um, that is really tough for people because all of a sudden they've got a paddock and a pony and they don't have to feed it and they think that's wonderful. They have to build yards and then they have to start to feed it and then if, you know, there's additional farrier work and there's additional drugs to try and keep this pony out of pain. So that is very common with the novice horse person. Yes. Um, you know, the laminitic side of things. But you'll often get... Um, ponies or horses as well that have an eye injury that people think oh you know that eye's a bit cloudy but it'll clear up you know eye injuries are incredibly difficult to treat horses treating horses eyes is incredibly difficult to treat you need about it needs to be an octopus you need to be trying to jamming that eye open sticking ointment in it holding its head still yes. you know it is one of the challenges and and even as a, a horsey person, you would find it difficult to, for, for a non-horsey person to try and treat a pony's eye three times a day with ulcer ointment is near impossible. It is a really tricky thing. And, you know, the bills for that, if people don't treat it straight away, they'll often have to end up paying the vet to go out three times a day to put the ointment in. And in worst case scenario, sedating the thing. So keeping your horse's eyes as healthy as possible is really important. Fly veils over summer, really important. Just the fact that low branches on trees, you know, things that um, novice people would never think about. That you know, oh, he's got a tree to shelter on. Well, you know, there's some branches there that if he throws his head up, he's going to jam it in his eye or... We're, you know, I've seen horses with branches through their, the fronts of their sinuses. Oh, gee. You know, so it's just, I guess, as a horse person, you would look at where you're going to put the horse and know Murphy's Law, that if there's something it can get stuck in, it'll get stuck in. Whereas a novice person, okay, we've got a seven-strand wire fence and two of those are barbed, cows have been in here, that's all good. There's bushes in the corner. You know, it's just that type of thing. You know, we're all terribly cautious owning horses as to where we put them. <laughs> what will they yes, wreck? Yes. <laughs> um, what can they rip their rugs on? <laughs> <laughs> so that's really tricky for a novice horse person. And often a novice horse person will buy the wrong horse because some educated horse person has done the wrong thing and sold them the wrong horse. So that is also very tricky. Yes, yes, it is. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horsechats.com. Have you got a book that you could recommend for the more novice horse owners? Oh, look, books these days are, you know, are a little bit of one of those things that I still have my books because I love them greatly. But any sort of general horse knowledge, I find the Pony Club manuals, some of the yep. Pony Club manuals that are put out are fantastic general knowledge books. And I highly recommend any person that's got a child that's interested in riding, take them to Pony Club. As a parent, you'll have other parents that will help you out with those silly questions that you think, God, nobody's going to ask this question. You know, some owners, it's tricky putting a halter on, for goodness sake. They don't <laughs> yep. come, nothing comes with instructions. Yep. The Pony Club manuals are super. They, they're just general knowledge, general health, you know, temperature of a horse, heart rate of a horse. And you know, most of the experienced equine community wouldn't be able to tell you what the temperature or the heart resting heart rate of your horse is. You know, how to tell the difference between a healthy horse and an unhealthy horse. And when I say unhealthy, I don't mean a dying horse. I mean one that's a bit off colour. What, what are the signs? How can you tell if your pony's getting laminitis? Can you feel his 
and you feel his feet. It, does he look like his foot sore? Is his stance unusual when he stands in the paddock? All those things. N- novice people are going to have no idea. So Pony Club's a wonderful institution for the certificate work that they do through their manuals, but also just you're mixing with other horsey people and that's how you're going to yes, gain a lot yes, of your knowledge, yes, really. I think that's good. I can't recommend Pony Club enough. <laughs> enough, yep, yep. Tell me what you're looking forward to now. Well, I've got, um, I'm still competing on my um, warm blood thoroughbred cross mare Yep. That's, I've currently in work. She is um, a show horse in the show, well, a show hunter, I should say, in the show season, and she is a um, dressage horse in the non-show season. So she's in the middle of her sort of our dressage season at the moment. I'm looking to find her a husband for the end <laughs> of this year. So she, <laughs> she will be campaigned after that, probably to the middle of next year. Um, and then we'll have babies for me. Um, but I've just had a lovely two-and-a-half-year-old that I bred out of a lovely thoroughbred mare by a wonderfully performing warm blood horse called Contender, and his stock is doing exceptionally well. Shane Rose is actually riding a horse called Swiper, who is by the same stallion as my two-and-a-half-year-old, and... He is going to be my next project. He's just come back from the breakers and and he looks super. I've, you know, I've had three rides on him so far and it's it's all going well and and I'm just loving his attitude and you know get on with it deal. So that's yep. wonderful. My my mare can be a little bit of a girl at times and sometimes she can be the girl with the curl <laughs> at times, which. <laughs> She's a little bit, I've read the horoscope today and I'm not having a good day. So yep. she can be a little bit tricky, but wonderful. You know, she has many positive points, but sometimes her willingness can be questionable. <laughs> okay. I, I was going to ask you, what are you doing, you know, when she's in foals, especially in late stages or when the foal's born, but it sounds like you've got it all worked out with this uh, contender foal. Yes, well, I've got him and I've got a full brother to him, which bizarrely is a red one. The second one's a red one. The first one's um, the two-and-a-half-year-old is brown with yep. four white socks and a star. And I think most of contenders 2016, uh, 15, I think it was, they were born. He was born, Robbie was born, were all brown with yep. white stars and four white socks. Yeah. In 2016... They're all red with white stockings and blazers, <laughs> so that's really interesting. But apparently Contender's dam line is is red and white, so mm-hmm. we've got a fair bit of bling on the yearling, um, and he's, he's just as nice as well. In fact, I think he'll probably be bigger than the two-and-a-half-year-old. He's quite a big boy, so I've got those two lovely boys coming on, so... And then when I choose Rosie's husband, that'll be a bit exciting. The trouble is it's a bit like going to a fancy restaurant with a very extensive menu, stallions these days. It's a bit yes. hard to know what to yes, pick. Some nice ones around, yeah. Ah, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful, okay. yeah. Andrea, just in a few sentences, would you be able to summarise your philosophy with horses? Just put it all together sort of just to finish off. I guess... My philosophy is to be prepared for the unexpected with horses always. They will break your heart. And I guess my philosophy as a coach, um, riding is all about feel. And sometimes you can read what you should be doing, but sometimes someone could help you try and trigger the, the feeling aspect of it. And always remember that how a rider can influence a horse and that a rider should make a horse's natural gates better, not um, hinder their natural way of going. So, you know, as a coach, that's definitely, definitely my philosophy to make my riders feel how they can influence the way their horses are going by sitting differently or applying the aids differently. Um, so that, that I find is a really interesting philosophy. And, of course, when you've got an obedient horse, you've got a safe horse, and my rider's safety is one of, well, is the yep. paramount thing for me. Yep, yep. 
Andrea, before we finish off as well, what about people contacting you? How can they contact you? We'll have your details on horsechats.com slash Andrea Riedel Kerosene, but just in case. I'm actually just thinking about this. If someone does want to go to your page, if they go to horsechats.com, if they search for Andrea or search for Kerosene or search for Riedel, which is R-I-E-D-E-L, yep. It's a tricky one, that one, isn't it? I wish I was related to the Riedel glass. <laughs> yeah, it might, might be easier just to search for Andrea, I think, or just, yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, tell us how people can contact you. Well, I'm very IT now, not at all, but <laughs> um, I do have a Facebook page and my um, equestrian centre, High Pine Equestrian Centre, has a Facebook page and there is contact details on there, but Possibly my mobile number, which I'm happy to give you if you like, is the easiest contact base, but service is not great, so texting is probably by far the easiest way to get me, and obviously I'm a horse person, so I'm never near the landline unless mm-hmm. I've pre-organised it. So my mobile is 0417-849-754, and... Please, if I don't answer it, it just means I'm coaching and where I coach in my indoor arena, I do not have any service for calls, but I always answer my texts. Okay, wonderful. Andrea, thank you for talking to us today. I've enjoyed your insights into the vet nursing side. I think that, you know, it's giving people something a little bit different and and a little bit of a different career path, although ultimately I suppose you're still coaching and riding and competing, but um, it's just something a little bit different and something for the more novices to be aware of as well. So I think that all that knowledge is good. Thanks for coming and hopefully we'll get you back sometime soon to talk about some of these things in a bit more detail. You're welcome. (laughs) This has been a pleasure. Okay, bye. If you've enjoyed this chat, then please comment, rate and subscribe. If you'd like any changes or recommendations for guests, then please contact us through horsechats.com. And while you're online, have a look at the government accredited courses at internationalhorsecollege.com. Registered Training Organisation 31352. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses, or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below 